Welcome back to part two of the SIBO Doctor podcast, and let's jump right back into it. Let's move on to other parts of your water paper where you talk about um, the methylation aspects being really disrupted because of this problem with cobalamin um, absor- what is it? absorption or I can't remember exactly. Yeah, various problems with cobalamin. I can't explain exactly how glyphosate messes it up because it's pretty scary. And I think B12 deficiency is probably systemic in our, in our society, in America. And that's really serious because B12 deficiency can cause dementia. You know, people, sometimes people have dementia and they find out they just get their B12 up, it goes away. So that's really exciting, positive news, but it would be really sad to have dementia on account of B12 deficiency, something you could correct and not know that, you know. So it's a, it, it's a really big problem. B12 is cobalamin. Cobalamin is a very big molecule and it's of course a B vitamin. And it's a, it's a fancy, really a, a exotic, I think, molecule with very interesting capabilities. and. Um, Cobalamin is difficult to, uh, to, to, to get into your body because it, it's, not, it's not just that you can take it and get it. Because if you've got problems with absorption of cobalamin, you can take tons of it orally and it won't make a difference. It won't go in. So there's a really big issue with the whole system that manages cobalamin. You know, there's an intrinsic factor. There's also there's an, uh, a protein that binds to cobalamin. I think it's a protein. There's a, something that the uh, cells in the in the stomach make that bind to cobalamin to protect it from the acid in the stomach. Because if it's going through the stomach acid, it'll get destroyed. Not the intrinsic factor? Intrinsic factor is another thing. So once it becomes, once it comes out of the stomach and it's no longer acidic and then intrinsic factor grabs it and facilitates its its transport across the gut. So it's really, we talked about in the paper, and I don't remember exactly this business about the acid, but I do remember that there was something that was produced probably by the parietal cells in the stomach that... um, that, that protects cobalamin during the acidic transport. And then of course it becomes less acidic and that's when that lets go. And then the intrinsic factor is crucial at that point to be able to let it be absorbed. And, and the parietal cells are very sensitive to glyphosate because glyphosate is, goes through the membrane much, much better, uh, hugely better under acidic conditions compared to non-acidic conditions. The stomach is very acid. So I think that those cells, the parietal cells in the stomach are getting hit hard by glyphosate. And that's causing uh, impairment in the ability to absorb the cobalamin. The other thing is the corin ring. Cobalamin, of course, has cobalt. And cobalt is a, is a mineral that gets chelated by glyphosate. So there's the issue of the availability of cobalt because glyphosate will grab hold of it and not let, and not let it loose. And so then it, it's, it becomes deficient. And a study on cows, looking at the different minerals in their blood, they found co- cobalt really, really low. It's eight different farms the cows at all the eight farms had extremely low levels of cobalt in their blood, uh, way below the minimum of the range that was expected. Uh, and they suspected that was because of glyphosate um, exposure in that paper. That was the whole point of the paper, that the glyphosate was causing them to have a severe deficiency in cobalt. Cobalt is this um, a wonderful atom that goes in the, uh, the mineral that goes into the center of this, uh, of this cage that cobalamin has as part of its structure. Um, which is the corn, uh, corn structure that's made out of these um, individual, four of these individual units that are produced by uh, enzymes that are affected by glyphosate. So there's been studies have shown that the glyphosate disrupts the, uh, the synthesis of the corn ring, which starts with glycine. So this glyphosate disrupts because it looks like glycine, that it blocks the enzyme that begins this whole uh, manufacturing process to make these pyrrole pyrrole units that go into the corn ring. So the assembly of the, of the, pro, of the uh, vitamin is disrupted. The, the mineral supply is disrupted. The ability to get it across the gut barrier is disrupted. So all these things are going to cause, I think, B12 deficiency in the context. And then, of course, if you're eating vegan diet, you've got, you've got none in your diet because there's no co- cobalamin in a, a strict vegan diet. It's really a, a, the sources are going to be animal-based. So for all those reasons. Yeah. And so with, so B12 is so important. Um, You know, I often check B12 in people and I can't say that I've come across super low uh, levels, you know, and I would say my comfort level with B12 uh, serum levels would be around uh, 500, 500, 600 is what I'm looking for. Anything below that, I do think that there is something. And then there are the various active uh, B12 or transcobalamin, and then there's 
um, methylmalonic acid that looks at B12. And sometimes I have very people that have very high levels, right? Which I know can also be an indication that it's just not getting into the cell. Um, yeah, well, there's a problem with it getting oxidized. That's another issue with B12. It can, you can be fooled into thinking that it's okay uh, because it's been oxidized and, that, and it, um, it doesn't work anymore. It's completely inactive, gets irreversibly oxidized. I think it's a cobalt plus three or something. I, I have to go back and look at the details of that. But I remember reading about that. It was really surprising to me that you could have high levels, but it might not be functional. And of course, glyphosate induces oxidation. So that could be a problem as well. Do you think that's the link to uh, why, there, I mean, there are some recent studies that link very high levels of B12 and they haven't looked at the oxidized versus unoxidized to higher cancer level rates, right? That's very interesting. And I want to go study that. That's new to me, but I, uh, that's very intriguing because I do suspect that high levels, very high levels might be an indicator of this problem of it having gotten into this irreversible state. And it's just there and it's not being removed, but it's also not functional. But the body keeps making more because it's not, there's not enough, but there's actually tons of it, but it just doesn't work. You know, that's quite possible, I think. Yeah. So I remember uh, reading this few papers out on, um, in the UK, they think of it as an early cancer marker now to, um, uh, to have high levels of B12 like that. But is it just like, can we, is the only way to fix that then to inject B12 or is uh, there's no use of giving it orally because that's, that's all. I know. Well, people do do that. Right. And I think they do get it up that way. And maybe that is effective. It's terrible to think that that's the only way you can get it in. I just hate the fact that the system is so disrupted, you know, that you have to inject it, but that might be the case. Yeah. Well, that's why, uh, you know, naturopathic physicians, we, we always kind of look around and we also creative thinkers. So we always think about how to yeah. increase stomach acid and, uh, you know, and I, maybe what you're saying uh, with the with glyphosate's effect on parietal cells that totally gels with what I've experienced. People are just more uh, in need of um, hydrochloric acid support. Doesn't mean that everybody needs HCL caps, but I use a lot of bitters and a lot of trying to coax these parietal cells back into producing. Um, it, like especially if B12 is low, I often do that. So that's very interesting. Um, okay, so be, besides B12 and, you know, with the methylation aspects, uh, what else? I think you mentioned something in your paper about other, other effects of, gly of glyphosate and how generally it affects methylation pathways. Was that the main? Well, it, it's very, yeah, it was so fascinating and I had so much fun. We both had so much fun writing that paper because, we, you know, trying to figure out the story. I always, uh, whenever I write a paper, I want there to be a story and the story puts the puzzle pieces together, you know, and that one really had, I think, a fabulous story. Uh, you can take a look at it and see, but it, we had this one figure that we ended up uh, putting in there that shows all this complex stuff that's going on, but it's really, really fascinating because it starts with the methionine, of course. Uh, methionine is, uh, is uh, methyl, it's, the, it's the supplier of methylation mm -hmm. pathways collectively all over, right? And so it's the homocysteine getting converted to methionine to re resupply methionine. When methionine has been used up, homocysteine goes back to methionine and uh, makes more with an enzyme that needs cobalamin. So it's actually only a few enzymes that need cobalamin. And they're very interesting to look at them together to see how they're choreographing a whole symphony, you know, in terms of what happens when cobalamin is broken, uh, a whole compensatory mechanism takes place that ultimately ends up attacking the myelin sheath in the brain. So it's quite, quite interesting. The, 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 we, we show that in the, the storyline of our paper, starting with this defect uh, in being able to make methionine, which then means methylation pathways are in trouble. There's not enough methylation. And at the same time, it disrupts the, um, the citric acid cycle because there's another enzyme um, that produces succinate from malinate. It's, a, it's an enzyme that feeds into the citric acid cycle. Succinate is a super important piece of the citric acid cycle. And it comes in from malinate and malinate comes from propionate. Propionate is that short three carbon fatty acid that's produced by the gut microbes. And so what happens is propionate piles up because it's blocked. It can't get converted to succinate and succinate becomes deficient. And so so the citric acid cycle, cycle is going to be disrupted unless you have another way to get that thing going. And that's where glutamate comes in. And so it's just really fascinating that the propionate suppresses an enzyme 
that uses glutamate to detox uh, ammonia. So you end up with <laughs> excess ammonia. And of course, ammonia goes to the brain and causes brain problems. And so, um, but the ammonia is actually able to replace taurine in the brain. So taurine can get loose and make sulfate. So there's like this whole orchestra of things that happen. And when you follow each one of them through, it all makes sense. And ultimately what you're doing is your immune cells are forced to steal sulfate, to steal raw materials to make sulfate from the neurons, from the myelin sheath in the neurons, because the whole system is so disrupted. And so sulfate's playing a role too, and, um, and the hydrogen sulfide gas as well. So you can see how when you read the paper, it's really, really fascinating. And um, they're all involved in it. And the, in the enos, which, is the, which we think is making sulfate in the red blood cells, also binds to cobalamin. We think that cobalamin binding is essential for it to make sulfate. So we think that sulfate synthesis also gets uh, derailed, as well as the methylation pathways. This is nitric oxide you're talking about, endothelial nitric oxide. Yeah, yeah, it makes nitric oxide, but it also makes sulfur dioxide. Uh, Greg and I have written papers on that. We think, again, this is theory, <laughs> but it's quite compelling. When you look at the red blood cells, they're so interesting because they have this molecule, enos, it's an enzyme that makes nitric oxide. But if the, if the red blood cells make nitric oxide, it's, it's terrible because it'll bind to the hemoglobin and disable it the same way as carbon monoxide does. So that people are really puzzled. Why do the red blood cells have this enzyme, which would actually destroy the hemoglobin you know, and prevent them from carrying oxygen? Why would they do that? And in fact, actually they work really hard to keep the substrate out. They, they don't bring in the arginine that you need to make the nitric oxide. So they're like, well, what is going on here? It's a big mystery as far as why do they have this enzyme and how could they possibly use it? And in fact, it stays on the membrane in the red blood cells. On the membrane is when it makes sulfate. It makes sulfur dioxide instead of nitric oxide. And this is a theory that Greg and I have, have developed. And again, it makes a whole lot of sense when you look at, at the red blood cells in particular. They need the sulfate to make the cholesterol sulfate to keep them with a negative charge. And they do that, I think, using this enos as their as the enzyme that makes it. And the enos has a, a place where it binds cobalamin. And the cobalamin, I think it's, it's actually glutathionyl co cobalamin. Co cobalamin hangs on to these various small molecules to make it possible for them to react. And the glutathione stuck to the cobalamin, stuck to the enos, <laughs> holds on to a sulfur atom that came from hydrogen sulfide gas in order to make the sulfate. So it's, it's quite fun. And the enos produces superoxide in that configuration instead of nitric oxide and the superoxide oxidizes the sulfur. So it's quite beautiful and cool. And it all fits into the whole narrative of the, uh, of the cobalamin deficiency, uh, working on those three different enzymes, but all inter interconnected in the process that's going on um, with a disruption of methylation pathways, disruption of sulfate, sulfation pathways. And then uh, finally the erosion of the myelin sheath in the brain um, as a consequence of a desperate need for sulfate when, when things are so messed up. Wow. I'm sure that a lot of listeners are, are, are lost in our conversation, but that's- They a, can go back and re read the paper. <laughs> that's right. Read the paper. It, it'll be in the show notes. It's just, um, it's a very elegant theory. I really like how it all comes together. And, um, you know, I love the fact that it's, it's not a, like- just the elegance of the body of trying to overcome a toxin and that it has these different mechanisms that we look at as disease states, but it really is just a way of the body saying, you know, I need this to survive. So that's, that's what I love. Yeah. So I love that. How does that, that scenario um, fit in? Okay. Let me just say that I want to talk about deuterium in a minute. But I know that people at this point are just horrified by the levels of glyphosate and the damage that it does. Is there anything, okay, besides banning the molecule, besides banning this, pest, uh, this herbicide, is there anything that you've come across that really helps to detoxify uh, uh, the body of, of glyphosate? Uh, there was a, a nice paper that I, I read uh, by some folks in Germany um, where they had cows that were sick and the cows were eating lots of glyphosate in their food and they measured glyphosate in the urine. It was high. And they, I think they probably were motivated by prior um, knowledge, but they actually fed them bentonite clay, um, sauerkraut juice, and fulvic acid and humic acid. So those were the things they tried. 
probably makes sense to you. And so, and that's been catching on then I think now with people and people like yourself and certainly naturopaths are, are, are supplementing people with these kinds of things um, to, uh, to help to clear the glyphosate. And they showed that it, the glyphosate levels went down and the cow's health improved. So it was pretty cool that what they did. And the sauerkraut juice was just really cute. <laughs> I love sauerkraut juice, but a lot of people wouldn't be able to tolerate that. I know. Little children, autistic kids are probably not going to be willing to drink sauerkraut juice. <laughs> but even sauerkraut or apple cider vinegar is also possible. Well, and that's got, you know, other benefits as well. But um, always be careful with, with in, like these dysregulated people, they, they need to be super, super careful and work with somebody that uh, really knows what they're doing would be my recommendation. Um, and then obviously improving sulfur pathways because sulfation and the, the whole process of detoxification and phase one, phase two, phase three of detoxification system all relies on sulfur to some extent. So improving that I would assume is some, because if we find it in the urine, it means it had to go through the whole system, right? So it had to go uh, through detoxification pathways, et cetera. So it's, it, we know it can be done. Um, so yeah, I'll just put that. I certainly always encourage people to eat high, high sulfur diet. And I'm rather obsessed with that. So we eat lots and lots of garlic. Uh, also, of course, herbs and spices. Uh, really spice up your meals and cook everything uh, from scratch. I think that's an important th message to get. I know people are so busy. They want to just eat processed foods and the processed foods are really toxic. So I, we have a huge problem in America because of people being too rushed to spend time in the kitchen. And so they end up just grabbing a bite from, a, from some kind of fast food joint, which has absolutely terribly uh, unhealthy food. Uh, and most Americans are just eating a terrible diet, um, with these and so you're basically you're throwing away a lot of the nutrition when you you basically take these foods and then you process them into food like substances you know that's like just pure flour pure sugar some artificial flavor i mean it's just disgusting right and then pure oil um you've missed all those wonderful molecules that are present in the plant so when you eat especially when you eat fresh vegetables uh, raw you know so salad we try to have a salad every night uh here everything's organic and, um, and then, of course, apple cider vinegar, you can use that on your salad dressing so, to help get some probiotics. And, um, and then sulfur-containing um, animal-based foods are terrific. And, and certainly organic eggs is a fantastic uh, food choice because they're rich in micronutrients. So basically sort of thinking in terms of eating foods that are rich in micronutrients and um, natural. So natural plants and natural animals is kind of a basic message that's that's the naturopathic creed and and mantra uh so uh, but you know obviously we're talking about people that would just be so symptomatic so if you are sensitive to sulfur and you've listened this far into the podcast then go back to my conversation with dr nye i had five years ago it was december 2017 um podcast on hydrogen sulfide and his whole conversation and he references Dr. Senef a lot. So that's a good one for you listener if you have issues with with um, sulfur. Now uh, let's talk about the uh, so this whole exclusion zone water is fascinating. You wanted me to also mention this other aspect of um, deuterium, this isotope of hydrogen. Um, what's the deal with that and how does that fit into the picture? Okay, <laughs> let's see what we can do. <laughs> it, it's hard to know where to begin, but deuterium is heavy hydrogen. It, it has a, it's, so hydrogen is the smallest atom. It has one neutron, one proton. I mean, one proton, one electron, and then deuterium has an extra neutron. Neutron is about the same weight as a proton, and electron is practically weightless. So it's twice as heavy, essentially twice as heavy as hydrogen, which gives it very different properties. It's naturally present in seawater at 155 parts per million, which doesn't sound like a lot. But that means the level in our blood is five times as much as what we have of calcium. So it's it's not trivial. It's a very small molecule, but there's a lot of it, you know. And so, um, and it turns out that it's extremely toxic to the mitochondria. Uh, and, and biology has really kind of, I think, biology has centered its its mechanisms around the concept of delivering low deuterium protons to the mitochondria. It's quite fascinating. Um, when you start reading about spe specialized enzymes that are able to choose hydrogen over deuterium. 
So when I have, a, I'm an enzyme, I have a substrate, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick off this hydrogen, I'm going to put it over here. If it's deuterium, I'll just throw that one away and go get a different molecule. I won't use it because I have really special skills as this particular kind of enzyme. And, um, and these enzymes are, um, are disturbed by glyphosate, many of them. Most of them even are disturbed by glyphosate, according to my glyphosate susceptibility motif. So as soon as I heard about deuterium uh, and realized that there were these enzymes that could select against it and, and knew that those were enzymes that were disrupted by glyphosate, I, I immediately, my ears perked up and I said, this has got to be a problem with glyphosate. It's disrupting the enzymes that know how to select hydrogen over deuterium. And, they, and it's a very, very important thing to do uh, to make the mitochondria healthy. And it's because the deuterium gets into those pumps that the ATPase pumps that make the ATP, the, the hydrogen is pouring through those pumps. The hydrogen motive force is what drives those pumps. And if you've got a deuterium in there, I, I liken it to sugar in the gas tank. It's basically that pump hates the deuterium. It breaks. Uh, it can break the pump. It can cause it to start releasing reactive oxygen species, which can cause mitochondrial damage, DNA mutations. So you can get really in trouble with your mitochondria if you can't keep deuterium out of that intermembrane space. So that's really the center of the deuterium problem. Okay, where do we, where are we exposed to deuterium? Is it in our diet, in our water, in, where's it coming it's from? It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's a natural, it's a natural substance. And our body hates it, especially our mitochondria, it hates it and it has- Well, our mitochondria hate it, but actually our gelled water likes it. Right. So that it, it, it helps to gel the water. And the body knows how to trap it in the gel. So this is what gets really interesting. So what I think is happening with the gelled water, remember we said it, it pumps out the protons and it creates a battery with a negative charge. The protons that it leaves that, that, that leave the gel are reduced, significantly reduced in the level of deuterium. I suspect, again, this hasn't been proven, this is theory. However, what has been proven is that the gut microbes, some of the gut microbes can make hydrogen gas from hydrogen that was originally attached to organic molecules. They make hydrogen gas in the gut. And that hydrogen gas, so I found a paper from the 1960s uh, looking at a microbe that made hydrogen gas. And they found out that that hydrogen gas that it made had only 20 parts per million of deuterium compared to 155 in seawater, 20. It's way, way down. And it makes sense because deuterium stays with the liquid phase. So whenever you make a gas, you get low deuterium hydrogen, I suspect which is really, really interesting because hydrogen sulfide gas also has low deuterium hydrogen, I suspect. And I think the body uses that. We make plenty of hydrogen gas, right? Like that's, that's part of not just a, like SIBO. SIBO, I, I have still a hard time wrapping my head. That could be a compensator, compensatory event in, uh, as a response to the lack of um, you know, protons, for example, that's needed for exclusions on water. Because SIBO has so many different causes, right? So it's not, and when we treat the causes, the SIBO disappears without having to necessarily address that. But but I get what you're saying that that is just part how the body recycles maybe hydrogen naturally because it also. I think it's yeah. Well, it's really really interesting in the gut because the, um, the microbes make this hydrogen gas, and then other micro microbes take the hydrogen gas and put it together with carbon dioxide to make methane. So I have methane gas, right? CH4, so that's four hydrogens and one carbon. And those hydrogens are gonna be really low in deuterium because they came from hydrogen gas. And now that methane gets converted to methanol. And then that's no longer a gas. And from methanol, it goes to formate, to formaldehyde, formaldehyde and then formate, and then finally back to CO2. So that whole chain of methane to methanol, to formaldehyde, to formate, to CO2, that whole chain is very, very important in metabolism and the whole thing came from that hydrogen gas. And so all of those hydrogens that are in that molecule are low deuterium. And the body knows that. And those things become the methyl groups that get shipped around by methionine. So it's really, really fascinating. All those methyls that are thrown around everywhere in the body, you know, the methylation of the proteins and the methylation of the DNA, those methyls are gold. And they're gold because they came from hydrogen sulfide gas. That's what I think. The body pays attention to those methyls and keeps them very um, carefully. And then eventually they actually get metabolized to carbon dioxide in the mitochondria, supplying them with low deuterium hydrogen. Right. Because I always, you know, methane to me is, 
just a carrier in a way, methane gas is, uh, and it's not a pathogen, you know, it's not like the um, Methanobrevibacter smithii, it's not a pathogen, it's, uh, we evolutionarily selected to have methanogens on board, these ancient species, to compact hydrogen gas. That was always- Yeah, to create low deuterium hydrogen. That's the thing. The methane traps the low deuterium hydrogen that came from the, um, from the hydrogen gas that the other bacteria made. And then that methane, methane normally gets converted to methanol, which then becomes, it can be no longer a gas. From that point, it's no longer a gas and eventually it can be metabolized. But the, um, the, the enzymes that take the methane and turn it into all those other things are all enzymes that are, uh, they're deuterium depleting enzymes and they're sensitive to glyphosate. They have the glyphosate sensitivity motif. So I think glyphosate is disrupting the enzymes that convert the methane back into organic matter that can be used uh, in metabolism and that can provide low deuterium hydrogen to the mitochondria. And as a consequence, you get excess methane. Of course, methane is a big problem with the greenhouse gases. You know, people talk about the cows being bad because they release all that methane. My guess is that if you fed the cows organic food, they wouldn't produce so much methane. You know, so one way to solve the cow problem is to feed them organic food. I suspect they think they've come across some uh, an algae product to um, to to feed the cows to reduce methane output. That would be interesting to see what that does to methane. Um, okay, so so that's this is just so fascinating. Um, okay, so we've covered just as a recap. <laughs> there's a lot to recap. But we covered all of the nasty effects that glyphosate has, not just on our microbiome, but also on our sulfur, sulfation pathways and collagen production on exclusion zone water. Um, we've talked about deuterium and, and its effects on uh, the mitochondria and also how it's actually a positive effect on exclusion zone water. So it's a lot to digest, really. and But... What okay? So, what is the best thing people can do other than eating a rich, uh, you know, a ri- diet? Is there? Well, let me go back to the deuterium. Is there a way to manage that through the diet? Because I think there is, there is, yes, fat. <laughs> That's the interesting thing. Animal-based fats have the lowest deuterium, so um, so people can actually measure the deuterium levels in different foods. And and I have not been able to get a lot of data, but enough data to see that the uh, the sugars and the carbs have higher deuterium significantly higher levels of deuterium than the fats. And in fact, the lowest deuterium in the foods that I've seen and the measures that I've found uh, was coconut oil. Coconut oil had the lowest deuterium. And then next to that was ghee, which is this sort of butter that, in, that they use in, um, in, in India. And then, um, and then regular butter, organic butter has less deuterium than inorganic, you know, than butter from cows that are fed toxic food. <laughs> so the, if the butter is made by the cow that's eating organic food, it has lower deuterium. And, um, and so the fats are all much lower. And it gets down to numbers like 110 compared to 155. So it's not like, you know, really low, but it's, um, but the, um, the sugars have the highest. And then the um, cottage cheese is somewhat lower. And then, um, and in fact, dairy, the, interestingly enough, humans uh, produce breast milk that's low in deuterium, low deuterium in the breast milk for the baby, which totally makes sense, right? Because you're trying to feed the baby um, a low, keep it, the, keep the deuterium low. Um, interestingly, deuterium was discovered by researchers in, uh, in um, Russia by looking at people in Siberia who were super healthy. They were living a long, healthy life, you know, up into their 110, 120 and still going strong type of thing. I mean, really amazing health. Um, and they, they were getting their water from the glacier. And so it turns out glacier water has low deuterium. And they market glacier water, I noticed on the web, as something that's, you know, you can spend money to buy glacier water. And that's because the water gets trapped in the ice. The ice is like the gel. It traps the deuterium. So the water that evaporates from the glacier, it can be down to as low as 90. Um, the lowest levels of deuterium that I found is in glacier water, naturally, naturally occurring in glacier water. And you can buy deuterium depleted water that's extremely low like 10 parts per million, which is synthesized in this big fancy lab. It's very hard to make and therefore also very expensive. So it's outrageously priced compared to what you would expect water to cost. And I don't think that's necessary. Yeah, that wouldn't be uh, you know necessarily necessary for your average healthy person. But 
Because it sounds like it ha- it also has, like, if we go too low on deuterium, wouldn't that affect this exclusion zone water? Yeah, I wouldn't drink water that's only 10 parts per million, but I actually do buy it and I mix it with regular water to make something that's essentially like glacier water. And I try to drink a glass of that every day, even though I'm healthy. So I believe in it enough to think, well, I might as well do that. <laughs> you know, Because from what I've read, I really think it's a crucial part of the story. And of course, mitochondrial dysfunction is associated with all kinds of diseases. And we see a lot of that, you know, and it's, there, there are so many different causes, but, and sometimes it feels like we're just looking at one part of the elephant, but we're trying to see more of the elephant by having discussions like this, because it fits in the disease model of many different issues that I've talked about with other experts on this podcast. So it's been, gosh, it's just been mind blowing to talk to you, Dr. Seneff. Um, I want to say, by the way, hydrogen sulfide gas is a low deuterium product, right? Just like hydrogen gas. They're both gases that are going to have low, low deuterium in those hydrogens. And so I think that's part of what's going on when you have this hydrogen sulfide buildup. It's a way for your body to try to um, provide low deuterium hydrogen to the mitochondria. Hydrogen sulfide actually goes into the mitochondria and gets oxidized to sulfate and, and thiosulfate. The mitochondria know how to oxidize it. But when they do that, they grab those hydrogens and those hydrogens are very valuable to them. So I think that this whole issue of all this hydrogen sulfide toxicity is a consequence of a desperate need for low hydrogen, low deuterium hydrogen in the mitochondria. Right. Um, Okay. I think I'm going to stop there because I have, I, my, my mind can't keep up anymore. Uh, But for everyone listening, um, Dr. Seneff has had like you know has a great book on glyphosate. You want to mention your book? Yeah, Toxic Legacy. Toxic Legacy. How the weed killer glyphosate is destroying our health and the environment. Okay, I'll put the link on there, or just uh, yeah. Yeah, I can send you a link and also a link to the paper, the water paper. That's great. The water paper was fantastic for sure. Thank you so much for joining me um, here on the podcast. This has been absolutely illuminating. I really appreciate your time. Um, are there any last minute thoughts that you have on this on this topic that you want to squeeze in, or you're 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 good? You're good on on it. I do want to mention sunlight again. Get out in the sun without sunscreen, without sunglasses. Okay, so this is always a challenge. Yeah, I'll tell you a story about my eyes, my eyes, because I had, uh, I've been wearing glasses forever. I'm nearsighted from a young age. And um, along about 15, 20 years ago, I stopped wearing my glasses. I just, uh, I just started taking them off when I was outdoors because I was reading about how important sunlight is and I think to the eyes as well. And then, um, and so I stopped, uh, I, and eventually I just stopped wearing my glasses all to, altogether, unless I had to be like, what, seeing uh, a slideshow or something like that. But in most of my life, I don't need my glasses. And I just went down and my glasses actually became uh, dysfunctional. Like when I tried to put them back on again, they weren't right. You know, I knew my eyes had changed and I couldn't wear them anymore. So I went just, just the other day, I I went to the eye doctor, I had my eyes exam and he looked at my glasses, which were quite old, you know, and he said, uh, well, these are completely wrong. Their, their, Their prescription is way too strong compared to what your eyes are. Your eyes have gotten better. He told me, he said, most people's eyes get worse when they age, but yours got better. And I don't have cataracts, you know, I don't have any issues. My degeneration, my eyes are fine. And my glasses are, are useless because they're too strong. Yeah, the benefits of sunlight, definitely, I would concur. I, you know, I do live in Australia, which has the highest rates of um, melanoma. So just take it always with a grain of salt, people, and, you know, do your own health research. But but I also do feel that sunlight obviously is very important for other other aspects. Um, I need to say, by the way, that glyphosate disrupts your body's ability to protect itself from the sun, especially your eyes. So when you have a lot of glyphosate in your eyes, it's going to cause them to become damaged by the sun. Uh, and, and the melanin, you know, in your eyes and also the melanin in your skin, come from the shikimate pathway, which glyphosate disrupts. So I think a lot of the problem. Wait, humans don't have shikimate. No, but the um, but the the shikimate pathway makes the precursors that then the body makes the melanin from, the tryptophan, the tyrosine, the shikimate from the plants. Well, and in the, and in the gut microbes, right? The gut microbes make those precursors to the melanin, so your melanin can become deficient because of a uh, of glyphosate um, exposure to the gut microbes, and that's going to mean that you don't have natural protection from the sun. 
So I think that's an issue. And in fact, it's studies have shown that glyphosate disrupts the eyes in animal studies. Well, after everything we've said, I wouldn't be surprised if it disrupts more than all the, all the things we've talked about today. It's like one of those things that, that uh, you know, it, it's surprising for such a small molecule because when you look at it, it just looks like glycine with a bit of phosphate and, and you know, like it, it looks benign. Yeah. So anyways, yeah. Okay. You know what? I do have to stop because otherwise my mind, I can't, my mind is blown officially. So <laughs> I'm officially out of questions right now. If I, if I, if I thought for a while, I would have some more, but, uh, again, I want to thank you for your time and all of your, uh, contributions to this super important topic. And, um, I wouldn't be surprised if you hear from me again soon, especially if you write more great papers like you did. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Right. Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. To access the biphasic diet and the SIBO success plan, or if you're a practitioner and would like to become an affiliate, go to thecebodoctor.com. Thank you for listening to the SIBO Doctor podcast. We hope you find the information in this episode useful in the treatment of your SIBO patients. Thanks to our sponsors, SIBOtest.com, a breath testing service with easy online ordering. Thanks again for listening.